Okay, welcome to the six QGIS Hydra webinar that uh, Kurt and I organized during the Corona crisis. Already the sixth one. Time flies when you're enjoying, and I hope you uh, you've enjoyed it as much as uh, as we are still doing that. And I hope you learned a lot, making use of this time that we are all a bit uh, grounded at home. Um, this time we'll talk about calculating the percentage of land cover per subcatchment. That's a very thematic title, but uh, I'll, I'll come to what you will learn uh, during this session uh, later. So uh, let me, as usual, introduce myself briefly for the new people. So I'm uh, Hans van der Kras. I'm a senior lecturer at IHE Delft Institute for Water Education. And uh, that's a, a unique institute in the world where we uh, are specialized in education on everything to do with water, going from, um, from the diehard engineering uh, and uh, catchment hydrology, what the book is mostly about, to uh, water management governance, uh, environmental sciences and those things related all to water. And we had a unique experience yesterday. We had our first online graduation ceremony. The batch of 2018 to 2020 was uh, graduating. And um, I was part of the, the small team uh, of creative people to make this a, a really good memory for the people uh, who are uh, graduating. And uh, I think we succeeded. It was very exciting, very challenging also because it can't be like face-to-face uh, -face completely. But, uh, but I think uh, we had an enjoyable session and you can see the video also on YouTube. We had a band live in the garden of the Institute. Everybody respected the social distancing rules and the uh, director uh, and the vice director had their talks. We even did a quiz together. So uh, if you want to have some inspiration on that for your own organization, uh, let me know how we can help each other with those things. Um, so I did my master's and my PhD at uh, Utrecht University. It's a university in the center of the Netherlands, uh, Department of Physical Geography. And for my PhD, I studied how to integrate satellite information uh, in soil moisture models using data assimilation. And I used uh, the PC raster Python uh, framework for that, that you can use for data assimilation, completely open source. Then I moved to uh, the Flemish Institute for Technological Research, VITO in Belgium. Uh, where I was uh, a researcher in uh, spatial dynamic modeling at the environmental modeling unit. And I was working on land use change uh, models, water quality and uh, air quality. And it was an exciting time with a young team where we uh, really went into open source and had a Python uh, group to, to uh, exchange knowledge on that. And then since 2012, I work at uh, IHE Delft and uh, have a very nice job there. I, I teach a lot in GIS, advocate for open source. Um, also modeling, remote sensing for hydrology is very important. Uh, also with a lot of open data. In my projects, I work on spatial data infrastructures, which we already covered in, uh, in one of the previous sessions and how to share and use open data. Today, we also cover it a little bit because we always need open data for the exercises and tasks that we do. And as I always say, is uh, field work is an important part of our work. We are not uh, only people behind the desk, but we also, I, I find that many GIS people in the world love to go out. And there are even great tools with QGIS and uh, field work, such as uh, uh, QField and the input app. And uh, in that way you can collect the data in the field. There's some tutorials that I have on that. And, uh, and I know that Kurt also has some material on that arts preparing. And um, yeah, I'm a board member of the Dutch QGIS user group, which started just in uh, the end of last year. And uh, yeah, if you want to be in touch with me, uh, you can always email me, uh, connect through LinkedIn or uh, on social media. I give the word to, uh, to Kurt to introduce him. Thanks, Hans. Um, yeah, it's nice. It looks like we have about uh, 60 people here so far. And it's, uh, I see a lot of familiar names and, and uh, some new friends that I know that haven't participated recently. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, people are coming back to this and um, able to take some time out and join us. I'm based in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the United States, and I run my own consulting business named Bird's Eye View. I'm also part of a fairly new venture called the Q Cooperative, which is myself and several um, developers and trainers and documenters. And we're um, starting out with a mission to provide QGIS support services, uh, especially in the US where there aren't a lot of support services available. So if people need um, custom plugins, new features in QGIS, that sort of thing, um, we're there to help. I also run a program 
called Community Health Maps, where I try to empower public health workers with um, open source tools to uh, map communities. And uh, that's becoming more and more important, I think, right now during COVID. And I do a wide variety of things. Um, as a self-employed person, I do, I wear a lot of hats. I do a little spatial analysis. I do some cartography and I do quite a bit of teaching. Although um, right now, like everyone else, um, they're all the face-to-face -face teaching has been canceled and it's uh, taking me a little longer than I'd hoped to kind of stand something up online, but I'm working on that. And I'm also an author. I've uh, published uh, six books on QGIS at this point, authored and co-authored. Um, Obviously, we're talking about QGIS for hydrological applications during this webinar, and I've also come out in the last year with a book called Discover QGIS 3X, which is a very large workbook, which is a really thorough treatment of um, QGIS. And um, I'm a member of the QGIS US user group and an OzGeo Charter member. So if you want to um, get in touch with me, uh, my contact information is at the bottom. And um, I'll be um, on chat during this answering questions. So as Hans goes through this uh, demonstration, if questions come up, you can put them in the chat and I'll try to get to those as we go through. Thanks, Kurt. So um, this is a series of seven free webinars. And uh, just to remind you what we have uh, done and what we're going to do, uh, we started the first one with preparing data from hard copy maps, uh, digitizing, georeferencing, a uh, bit of styling of, uh, of hydrological data. Um, then we imported tabula tabular data, like data from spreadsheets into QGIS. Uh, we did interpolation, spatial interpolation, during, uh, using two techniques, and we compared them. And um, then we went in the third session into spatial analysis using map algebra, so we covered a lot of raster analysis. Um, in the fourth session, an important topic for, for many hydrologists is how to do the stream and catchment delineation. Um, we walked uh, through the whole procedure. In the fifth session, we added open data to our uh, catchment using data from uh, web map services, but also from OpenStreetMap, which is very useful in uh, many areas where we work, where data is available. And OpenStreetMap is a very nice uh, community-based uh, map that is, uh, has direct access from, uh, from QGIS to, to add vector data. Um, Kurt also in that session uh, covered uh, the community, so that was last week. And uh, that's also nice because uh, QGIS is, a, is not only good software, great software, but also uh, great people behind it. And you're also part of that, that community and you can become active. Uh, so watch that video again if you want to learn how, uh, how to become active in the community and what you can do for, uh, for each other there. Then in the, this session, we will do the calculation of a uh, percentage of land cover per subcatchment. Uh, I will explain that later. And then next week is already the last one in this series. And I already get requests from people in my mailbox about what, what's up next. Well, we still have to think about that, uh, but uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep you posted. This, this is keeping us uh, quite busy amongst our, our other tasks. So uh, let's see what we can come up with. Um, but the next time, uh, Kurt will maybe be doing the demo on, uh, on map design and teach you all the tips and tricks uh, in, uh, that are hidden in, in QGIS to make great catchment maps like the one that we see on the cover of the book. So uh, definitely you have to join next time. Um, the webinars are based on the chapters of the book as said, so you can order the book uh, at uh, Locate Press. The link is uh, on the screen. And uh, with your uh, uh, buying the book, you contribute to a fund to uh, allow uh, my students from the Global South to join QGIS and Phosphor-G events. And that's very important. We have talked about the community, but uh, diversity is also very important. And we like to see more people from the Global South becoming active in uh, the open source communities such as uh, QGIS. And I hope with the book, we can contribute to that. So for today, calculating the percentage of land cover per subcatchment, basically we start with uh, two data sets, one open source, open access data set uh, on, on land use land cover that we uh, have seen before in the, in the previous session, but now we'll use the real data, not from the web map service, but the real data, the, the, the layer is really available for calculations also. And I'll show also where you can get that. And we have here a layer with vectors from, um, 
subcatchments that were delineated in a similar way as in uh, session number four, but now for many uh, subcatchments. And the idea is that we want to have the statistics, the percentage of each land cover per subcatchment derived using vector analysis. So in the end, we want to end up in the, with these kind of pie charts for each uh, subcatchment, and we're going to use the data plotly plugin for that. So vector analysis, that's a bit of a theory that will pass or will be demonstrated in this session. Um, we'll focus mostly on uh, these kind of vector processing tools like intersections, we're going to make that. Uh, we're not gonna do union, but uh, here you see uh, what, what happens then. And um, we will do dissolve, that's, uh, that's this, when we have uh, two features and we can, can merge them together and remove the border, as you saw. And there's a buffer, we're not gonna do that, but these are the, the mostly uh, used ones in uh, geo-processing for, for vectors. So uh, I'm gonna switch now to, um, to sharing my uh, screen. And you know that you can add uh, indeed your questions in the, in the chat. Here are in QGIS. I always use the LTR versions. We always get a lot of questions about that, but the LTR versions, the long-term releases work uh, uh, best with the exercises. They are tested and uh, newer versions are also nice. They have new features, but um, they can also introduce new bugs. So we have to be very careful with that in operational use and uh, with these exercises. So for this exercise, I need uh, the catchment polygons. That's this data set. It's a simple shape file derived with uh, knowledge from chapter four. I'm gonna style it a little bit and just use a, a simple outline, make it a bit thicker for later. And let's have a look at the attribute table. And we see, as we learned in the, the fourth uh, session, that when we delineate the catchment, it will get automatically uh, the end column with the value of 100. So I have here features with a value 100. See if I select it in the attribute table, we can see them highlighted in yellow. Now that's not very useful for our analysis. So the first step that I'm going to do is to give each subcatchment a unique value. I deviate a little bit from the, from the book sometimes to show you other approaches to do that because in GIS, and that's a nice thing, you can do the same thing with different ways, with different approaches, but also with different buttons. So I'll show you that. So I'm gonna use uh, for that this, uh, this button. This is the field calculator. And you get this uh, nice dialogue. And what I can do here is I can create a new field, but that's not what I want in this case. I want to update an existing field and I want to update the DN field. And I want to update it with a function which gives a unique value to each feature. And there's uh, this set of functions here. So there are many functions in here and we'll use a, a lot today or a few because there are a lot. Uh, record and attributes, I have to look under that one. And there we find a dollar ID function and this returns the feature ID of the current row. And every feature has an internal feature ID, and that's the one I'm going to use. So if I want to use that function, I simply double click. And if it doesn't give an error here, it means it's okay. And uh, now it will update the existing field DN with the ID. So if I do okay, you should have noticed that it automatically switched to editing mode. So that's uh, interesting. Oh, I had one selected still, so I have to do it again. Um, Deselect all, so because I want them all with the unique value. So let's uh, let's show the other method. DN equals, and then this is the other editor. And go to dollar ID. You can also simply type it there, but to avoid typos, I do this. I say okay, and then I have to say update all, and now the DN numbers are changed into unique follow-up numbers that we can uh, use further to identify uh, the catchment. Now I also need uh, the area of the polygons. And there are some nice internal functions for that. Let's also, um, let's use this uh, main editor for that. I'm going to add a new column. Later I'll show you to do it in the other way. And I'm going to call this uh, catch area.
give a little comment and uh, units will be in square meters because that's uh, related to our projection. I'm using here UTM zone 32 north, like uh, the, the example for the rule. And it's not a whole number, I need a decimal number. And I need to specify a length and a position. That length is the amount of uh, digits for the number. And precision is the amount of uh, decimals, so it's in two decimals. And there I have a new column. And then make sure always you choose here the output column because this is an equation. Output column equals and then some, something you want to calculate. And I'm going to use this button to do the calculation. As I said, you can also use the other dialog. Now, since the uh, surface area is related to the geometry of these polygons, I have to look here under the geometry. If it's lines, I can calculate the length of a line, but with polygons, you can calculate the area. And it returns the area of the feature, and it, uh, it's based on the, the projection that you use. So simply double click, enters it, and here we see a preview. And then I do uh, OK. And catchment equals dollar area. I do update all, and now we see the values in square meters added to uh, this uh, attribute table. Now I toggle off editing, I save it, and uh, that's the first step. We have the catchment, the sub catchment areas for each unique number here calculated. Now let's have a look at our uh, data for the land use land cover. And last time we looked at the Korean data set for 2012 uh, as a web map service. Today we're going to use a downloaded data set um, from uh, the European uh, SDI, Copernicus, the European uh, system for monitoring the earth. And I'm going to look in the pan-European data sets, which contains the land use land cover. And I want the Korean land cover. And there, I guess for the different years, the, the European land use land cover data set, Korean. And uh, I'm going to add this one for 2018. That's the newest that is available. And it will load a preview, a web map service, like we've seen last time. Um, but in this case, I want to download the data because I want to process it, do a factor analysis with that. So I go to the download tab. And um, I see here the different data types that are available. So there's a 100 meter spatial resolution raster data set, a GeoTIFF. There's a SRE Geo database. But there's also a Geo package. And I know that the book mentions SKULITE, but uh, on this side, they updated it. So. Um, and we are happy to see that they adopt the geo package as a, as a standard to provide. And uh, I'm not going to download, of course, this huge file in, uh, in this session. I've already downloaded it for you. But you can see that this is huge vector data for the whole of Europe with all the land use land cover, metadata, etc. that we're going to use. Uh, you need to have an account to log in, but uh, it's uh, open data. So I've, I've downloaded that and um, let's continue in, uh, in QGIS. So go to the browser panel, and uh, here is the, the geo package. So I'll open it. And uh, the, if you download it, it comes with all these files. And so it has uh, data on legend, it has metadata, all kinds of descriptions. We're going to look at that also a bit. And um, I'm going to add this first land use land cover layer there. It's huge, gigabytes. And it, it comes with this pop-up because it has to adapt to our on-the-fly reprojection. It uses the 3035, and we need to visualize them 32632 UTM. And I'm going to use this first converter for that. And there it loads. And QGIS is so smart to load only the part that I have on the screen. Otherwise, it will be really, really slow. And uh, fortunately, that's not the case here. So the first thing I'm going to do is to, uh, to style this layer because uh, the data provider was so good to provide us with different files that we can use in different software to style it. So uh, I'm not going to use the layer styling panel for that because I need to load a file and I can do that through the properties. So I go to the layer properties, symbology, and then you have this style button here. I'm going to load the style. You're now in the database styles manager and I can load it from a file. 
I keep everything checked because I want everything that, that's in the file and I go to browse to the file. And it's in that legend folder that comes with your download. And there are two types here. There is the QML and the SLD. So there is the CLC uh, legend QML. That's the QGIS native format. And there is the SLD file, which is the OGC standard for uh, legends. Here I'm going to choose the QGIS format. So you can use uh, either. I do load style. And you see here the colors, the labels, and uh, the values uh, added. And um, this is so-called uh, level three data for the land use land cover. You can find on the internet how, how that works for Corrine, but it means it's very uh, detailed. And what we're going to do later is work on the level one data. So we're going to use only the first value. So the first value is level one. The second is a more detailed uh, classification, level two. And this is the final detail, level three. Um, so I do OK. And it will apply uh, the legend. I'll put the, the catchment polygons on top. So here we see styled data. Now remember that we had this huge land use land cover data of the full of Europe already in our um, uh, project. And I only need this part. And the other thing I need is a reprojection because if we want to do processing, if it's raster or vector, it is always very good advice to reproject the data to the same projection. And we're going to work in the UTM zone 32. So, and we can do that in one step. So I'm going to click right here and use the export function, save features as. And uh, in the book, I use the shapefile here. I'm going to make a new uh, geo package uh, database for this exercise. Um, so chapter six, and uh, let's call this uh, Ruhr Subcatchments. That's the name of the database. And then this layer, I'll call it uh, Corrine 2018 subset. That's the table that will go into this database. I'll change here the projection to the one of the project. And I'm going to use this extend function to clip it to approximately the bounding box of catchment polygons to reduce the data set. Uh, there's an API for Kareem data uh, for sure. I see that in, uh, as a question. Uh, of course, it uses the, the web map services, the, the geo APIs that we've seen in, uh, in the previous session. Uh, there are many other ways, I guess, also to, to get to that data. Uh, it's open data. It follows the INSPIRE directive uh, of the European Union. So I've calculated here the, the boundary from the catchment polygons, and that will be used to, uh, to clip it and reproject this data and store it then in the geo package. So I do OK. It will then store the data in the new geo package. I will copy the style. And I'll paste it here. It's always a very nice thing to do. And uh, it gets uh, camouflaged, but I will remove the big one. We don't need it anymore. And there it is, the subset of the land use around uh, our subcatchments. So that's, uh, that's great. Then the next step that we need to do is to get to that uh, level three data. And um, we're going to do that, uh, let's see. We're going to do that in uh, a different way than in the book, uh, because that way will also be used later. So I can show both in this uh, webinar. So I go to the attribute table. If you do that with the big data set, it will load uh, for a long time because there is hundreds of thousands of uh, features in that. So this is the Corrine data set. Um, this area here is the original area of, uh, of these things and we're going to modify that by doing all kinds of processing to get uh, the real areas uh, per subcatchment. And what I need is uh, I have this code 18 which is the level 3 data and I'm interested to get it to level 1 so I want only the first number as classes. And what I can do is use the field calculator as you, you learned and I'm going to create a new field I'm going to call the field level one. And it will be a whole number, integer. 
And I'm not going to use the conditional function. You will uh, learn that later in this session, but I'm going to use a string function because these numbers are strings. And it's a quick way of solving this. There's the left function here, which says it returns a substring that contains the n leftmost, char uh, leftmost characters of the string. So I use here left. Then I need to identify the field from which I want to count the string numbers from the left. And I want it from code 18. Then I use a comma and I specify how many characters from the left. I only want one. Then I close the brackets and here we get a nice preview. But I also want to convert the data type because it's a string and I want it to be a number just to show you how it works. It doesn't really affect uh, this uh, analysis. So here's a um, to int, to integer function. Puts a bracket there, we need a bracket to close. Okay, create field, level one, whole number, apply this, and then I do okay. And here you see that it takes now the first number of each feature, and uh, we now have chosen the, the left uh, value. In the book, indeed, we use the case when function, but we applied it also later here. So here you can also use the case when function, that's a condition. Uh, the only problem is that you have to, uh, that, that will take you many lines of code to do uh, exactly the same as I did here in, in one line. But you'll see it later when we have to do the, to add strings to the different classes that we have here. Um, so that was the, the first thing that I needed to do to aggregate those steps. Now what I also want is to dissolve all these features. So I'm gonna toggle off the editing, I'm gonna save it. So now it's stored in our uh, geo package. And what I want now is uh, that all these classes are one feature and we can then later uh, intersect that uh, with uh, the cache one boundaries. So I'm going here to the vector geoprocessing tools. I'm going to choose here dissolve. And we're going to use this Korean subset. And I want to dissolve based on the level one values so that all the level one uh, features uh, uh, are, are grouped and we don't have those uh, subsets anymore, the, the level three data uh, at that level as features. And uh, I'll store it in the geo package. So I'm going to use the geo package that we already have. And it gives a pop-up, how do I want to call my layer name? And I'm going to call this uh, Corrine 2018 Dissolved. Okay, then I run it. Takes a bit, still a bit large. And that basically reduces uh, the amount of features to uh, the amount of classes that we have. Okay, it's done. Let's have a look. So I'm gonna open the attribute table to see what happened. There we see it, we only have five features. So each class becomes uh, one feature. If I select one, it will be uh, highlighted. It's a small one, but we see it here in yellow. So that's nice. Um, now, of course, we need to uh, use other uh, styles if we want to use that. But uh, let me first uh, go to the next step, which is the uh, intersection. Because now we have all these uh, classes one to five from the level one. I want to intersect that now with the boundaries of these subcatchments. So these are then uh, like a cookie cutter combined and we have those boundaries added to the class boundaries. So that's another vector processing tool, which is called intersection. And I'm going to use here the Korean dissolved and as the overlay layer, I'll use here uh, the catchment polygons. I keep the other things as default. I simply want to have the whole data set uh, intersected. And I give here the output name, save it to the same geo package. And I'm going to give it a name, Korean catch intersected. And uh, let's run it. 
Um, this is uh, an expected error for me, for you maybe not. But when you do these uh, catchment delineations, uh, you can have uh, geometrical issues when you convert your rasters to polygons. And um, you need to fix that. And uh, how to fix that is very easily. So you need a processing tool for that, which is called Fixed Geometries. And there we are going to fix the geometry of Korean 2018 dissolved. Save it again to the geo package. And I call it Korean 2018. Oh. I'm choosing, yeah. I'm going to call the output, uh, the, this one, uh, Korean 2018 dissolved fixed. And then I run it. And uh, it's fixed. So another trick is to, to calculate a buffer of, uh, of zero. And um, that's the classic way of, of fixing this. So vector, geoprocessing tools, and then uh, buffer. Catch polygons, I put it on zero. And we keep everything else as it should be. Save it to the geo package. And I call this one a fixed buffer. Run it. And then your processing tools, intersection. Um, the input layer should be the Korean. Oh, okay, I, I think I, I fixed the wrong one there. That's always in, in live sessions. So the Korean is okay, and uh, this one should have fixed uh, the, the catchment polygons. And then here we have the intersection. Okay. In here, we run it. Yeah, you should always fix the right one. <laughs> Apparently, I fixed the wrong one. Of course, the problem is you are your catchment and not uh, the, the land use layer here. That should be geometrically uh, quite okay. So here we have it intersected. Let me uh, remove the other layers. And this one, and this one, we don't need that anymore. So we end up with the intersected uh, polygons and land use layer. I'm gonna style this one. And I prepared that, but normally you would do that um, using the uh, categorized and you choose the column in this case in this case uh, level one you click uh, classify and then you you give the colors in this case i, I prepared already uh, a legend so i'm going to load that and i've uh, let's saved it in an sld file so i can simply load that prepared file remember uh, previously we used the QML file, and in this case, uh, use a prepared SLD file. Open it, load the style, and there it is. And there we see the colors and the different um, names next to it that I stored previously uh, for this session in the SLD file. The SLD, remember, is the open standard, and the QML is the, the QGIS uh, format. And they're both uh, supported. So what we're going to do now is uh, a bit of a more um, analysis in the attribute table. We're almost there. So what we have is the catchment area. And now I need, of course, the area of the class and I need to calculate then the percentage of that class based on the, the area of the, the catchment. So go to editing mode, I'm going to add a new column and I call that one class area. Square meters. And it will be a decimal number. 
we're now in a geo package that was different previously uh, with the catchment polygon shape file. So it doesn't ask us to specify the amount of positions and decimals. There it is, the column is added. And uh, we're going to do the calculation. So class area equals, and we can simply type there the dollar area function. If you don't remember that function, you can do again what, what I previously showed. So make sure this equation is correct, otherwise you have uh, common mistakes to assign it to the wrong class. I'm going to do update all. And there we have the class area. So I have the catchment area and the class area. And now I'm going to use the field calculator to calculate uh, the percentage. And there, create a new field. By the way, a virtual field is something that you, is saved to your project, but not to your, um, your vector file. So if you want to have it only available in your project and not be added to your vector file, you create a virtual field. Also a useful function. Create a new field. I call this one percentage. It'll be decimal. And uh, there we are going to use a bracket. Going to use the class area, divided by the catchment area times 100%. And uh, that's basically it. So then I do OK. And we have a new column, as you can see, with the percentages. So for each land use in each subcatchment, we get the percentage. That's, uh, that's what we wanted. Now, just a bit for uh, adding here then the names of the, the legend, I'm going to uh, explain this uh, case function. So I'm going to add a new column. I'm going, going to call this one uh, land cover. It will be a string text. Length, uh, make it a bit long, let's say 15 characters. There's the field, I made a typo there, but it doesn't matter now. Uh, output land cover equals, I'm going to use this editor. And there we're going to use a conditional function. So what I basically want if is if it's class one, it should be artificial surface, class two, agriculture, etc. So you find here the conditionals, and there's the case one, that's exactly the, the function that does it. I double click and I see here the syntax. And uh, what I'm going to do is make it visually a bit easier. So case is the condition, when, and I'm going to replace this part. So when, level one equals one, then and we move the end part to the end later, then it should return um, land cover, uh, it should return one, and I'm gonna copy this, Should not return one, the class name. So it should be a string. So remember from uh, one of the first sessions, you need to use a single quote. And then the first class is artificial, as we can still see on the left in the legend. And then class number two is agriculture. Class number three. Forests, names are a bit longer, but I think you get the message here. Four equals wetlands, and five is water. And the function ends with end. And we don't see an error here, but we see water, so that's good. And then uh, we do OK. And then you see this whole equation added there. Land cover equals this whole thing. And then I do update all, and it will write here the class names. So that's how the case when function works. So you can apply it to numerical, to string, to, to all these things. I'm gonna save the attribute table. So it's now stored in our uh, geo package. 
And I think we are now ready to uh, visualize the result in the uh, data plot leak plugin. We used the plugin before, so it's here with the button. I'm going to open the data plot leak uh, dialog. And uh, what I want is to select uh, a subcatchment here. So and let's uh, select based on the attribute that's better. Um, okay, so this function here, select features using an expression is very uh, useful. So I want to make a pie chart of one subcatchment to start with. So get the fields and values. And I want to have here uh, the DN. Here get all the unique values if you press that button. So these are the DN values, the unique values that we added. Remember, therefore, we needed that to add those unique values. Equals, and let's start with the zero one. I select those features. They are selected now, highlighted in yellow on the map. So we're going to calculate the pie chart for this subcatchment. I choose here the pie chart. I use only selected features. As a grouping field, um, hmm, that's interesting. I was expecting the land use. I'm choosing the wrong one, of course. Need that one. You have to keep your attention when you do this live, otherwise you drift off with your talks and your thoughts. But we, of course, need uh, as a grouping, uh, we need uh, the the land use, land cover, this one, and uh, as the Y field. Uh, let's make sure I do it right. Is the Y field, of course, the percentage. Then we can uh, edit also here the plot title. I want a horizontal legend. And uh, I want to call this one land cover catchment DM0. And this is land cover. And uh, let's see how our plot looks like. So I'm going to do create plot. And there it shows up. So it uses those values from the attribute table. I get here the percentages, and here I get uh, the legend. And you can repeat it by selecting uh, different subcatchments and uh, then update uh, the graph or create uh, multiple graphs. So that's basically a walkthrough of this uh, exercise. There are many ways to, to come to this result or, or different results. There are other ways also to create charts. Um, but we are lucky today that we have a special mystery guest again. And who we have here is the developer of the Data Plotly plugin. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And I'm going to invite uh, Matteo, Matteo Guetta, to uh, share his screen. I will unmute you. Hi, Matteo. Uh, wait. You Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Great that you are here. Yeah, hi, Kurt. Hi, Hans. Hi, everybody. Uh, glad to be here with you and to participate in this webinar series. And yes, my name is Matteo Guetta. I developed the Data Plotly plugin three years ago, more or less. And that's great that I see every, every, everybody using it and with some really use useful use cases and yeah i'm going to make a quick demonstration of some maybe and hopefully nice feature and can i start sharing my screen sure okay let me okay i have this stuff here okay so i have some data set some basic data set some simple data set actually some real data set i downloaded it this morning. For example, we are in this COVID crisis, COVID quarantine, and this COVID table, I'll just have a look in the attribute table. As you can see, this is a huge, massive uh, data set. We have thousands of, of records. So we are actually, I am going to show you some nice feature. Uh, for example, we are going to 
filter this data set for just for example whitelist that's that's easily and to i will show you how to overlap different plots in one single plot canvas and how to how to add a, a nice feature that is a range slider okay so as you can see we have here a date time um, we have this a date time column and we have this deaths and this case is columns okay so i will start that data plotly and so choosing the covid table um, before to choose the x the x and y fields i'm going to use uh, this feature data set um, overriding button and i already prepared the the expression that is actually entity equals to Italy. Of course, you can change it to whatever place you are. And we are not making a simple, just a simple plot or plot and lines scatter plot, but we are making just a line scatter plot. Okay, for daytime and cases. So let's go. It can take a while because we have a massive data set. Oh, of course, I did not. Will, be a, will we end up in something that it's wrong because I didn't activate the feature subset. So I'm going to clean the plot canvas and do the plot again. It will take less. Okay. So you can move the legend and you can change the axis titles. And of course, you can readapt your plot, your plot canvas. Okay. So we are going to hit this gear, blue gear button, and we have this nice feature here that it's called show the uh, range slider. And if you check it, and if you update a plot, you have this nice, I'll just move it, make it a little bit bigger maybe. Okay, you have this nice range slider that is actually connected to the main plot. Okay, then I will go again in the main plot in plot tab, uh, I will leave the feature subset, subset the same, of course, and I'm going to change from the cases and I'm going to add the deaths. Okay, going to also change the color, making it to red lines. I'm not going to update a plot, but I'm going to create another plot, so it's going to overlap. And you can see this, these two different the two different scatter plot overlapped in, in the same one. Okay, you have the legend. If you double click, okay. Okay, if you double click on one items or on the other, it will uh, isolate one single line and readapt all the plot. Okay, then I will just change the the main uh, the main table from the COVID table to the admins. Okay, and from the admins, I'm going to, um, to delete the feature subset expression. I will take the continent, for example, and I will take, for example, we can leave the deaths or yeah, the deaths, it's okay. And we are not making a scatter plot, but we are making a pie chart as Hans did just minutes, some minutes ago. And we are okay, cleaning the plot canvas and creating another plot. And that's okay. So that's actually the same one. What I want you to show is that if you click on the pie chart, on the pie, on the pie slice, actually, you can see the same, the same feature highlighted and selected on the main map. Okay. Of course, again, here you can isolate the single items in the plot and the plot will readapt. Uh, itself to, to what you have chosen. Okay, last thing is that thanks to the crowdfunding campaign of the last year, we were able to put the data plotly also in the, in the, lay, in the print, in the map layout composer. So you can actually export your plot uh, when, you, when you export PDF or, or PNG um, images. So really quickly, I'm going to make another plot, uh, another layout. Okay, make it bigger. I will hold my just have this okay, this zoom stuff in the middle. Okay. Then I'm going to add a map, big map, okay, of the entire world. What is cool about data plotly of 
of um, of data vault within the the, um, the layout composer is that it is actually able to to understand what an atlas is so i'm going to generate an atlas i'm going to to check the admins main layer so the station layer and i'm going to to choose the admin um, oa3 this weird column name as the page name and also i'm going to filter this this layer with an expression that i have in the recent one because we have some some countries that luckily don't have didn't have any uh, or massive health problem with this covid crisis and i should have it yeah so actually it's not null and case is not null so we we are filtering this this uh, this layer with just the country that had actually some cases and okay then in the item properties of the main plot canvas on the on on the map canvas we are going to click on the control by atlas and we can hit the atlas and as you might know you can just loop on each country to see the different the different the different areas okay then what we are going to do is to use the data plotly button okay i'm just going to make a similar button but what we have here since the last week actually or 10 yeah maybe 10 days ago is this nice feature that you can overlap plots also in the in the in the layout composer that's a brand new feature okay so for the first plot we are going to make pretty much pretty much the same the same thing okay so we are set up the selected plot the main scatter plot okay we are making again a scatter plot we are taking actually the covid table but we and we are subsetting the covid table with an expression so actually only the we are just filtering the countries in the covid table with the with the country that is highlighted by the atlas and we are going to use this feature this expression oops code here okay so code is equal to the atlas page name and okay so we filtered it here then we again are we are using the date time x as the x axis and as y again for example the date okay blue is okay not points not lines we are making a little bit thicker maybe three and we are going to update the plot okay i don't know if you can see that else i will make really thick thicker and thicker okay so actually if you change the country the plot is updating itself okay then i'm just hitting on the back button and i'm going to in the same in the same plot i'm going to add the second plot here it is we are going to set up the second plot again covid table and again we are subsetting with the same expression okay daytime again as the x and that's as the main one okay we are just making it green and again thick update okay i think i have chosen the same one okay so cases where is it okay lines and not points and update mode okay now for example if we choose another country okay and here it is and so you can actually export your atlas as a png so a single big super big um, pdf sorry not png a uh, super uh, single big pdf with several pages one for each country or as many pngs or as many images as you want okay so that was stop share okay here again 
That was really great, uh, Matteo. Really, okay. really useful functionality that uh, that has been added in uh, in, in recent uh, dates to to QGIS. Um, a very actual data set that you're showing us. Set that was actually that. from from this morning. Actually, I downloaded it this morning. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Really, really nice. Um, let's have a look if there are questions from uh, the audience. Otherwise, I also have a few questions. Did, did you see any questions from Matteo already, uh, Kurt? Uh, let me unmute you. Yes. Well, I think we covered everything that people asked so far. Um, but um, Matteo, where did you get that data set? From the, actually from the uh, our war in data org website that is taking the web the all the data from the john hopkins university but okay. i if you want i can share with, with you enhance the the entire the entire project so that's that's not a problem i have a single that's as you can see as you saw it's a single geo package with, with just two layers and one print layout so that's not a problem to share that with you nice that'd be great yeah yeah of course uh, Matteo, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. As you've seen that I, I have this land, uh, land cover data set and I create a pie chart, but then the legend colors are not the same as uh, of the, the legend of the, the land cover map. Is there a way to solve that mm -hmm. with some data if, overwrite or um, is there some functionality? Actually, actually, if you look in the main data model repository, um, 10 minutes ago, we had uh, a commit on a pull request that from one, uh, a guy that is working on that. Because actually that's that's not simple. So you have to, I mean, there is a way, not now, but in the future that the version, it will be there. Uh, you have to use some kind of um, a QGIS expression to do that. Because that's the same also for, for a bar chart when you use a third variables to, to, to change the color of, of the single of the single bar. So you have to use some, some expression, but it will be lent soon, hopefully. Okay, I'm curious to see that. Hey, Matteo, I'm wondering, um, seems like Plotly is getting so mature and so widely used. Has there been any discussion of having it actually be, become part of Core and QGIS? I, I spoke with, with, with Niall and with other developers, and actually um, I was hoping that months ago, but actually it's really better to, to have it as a separate plugin because um, you have... QJS and you have all the plugins, so I can update Plotly every 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 I don't know every week, for example, or or if you hit a bug or a feature request, then you you should not wait for for the next I don't know long term re release of QJS, for example, or 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 the next stable release. So actually, that's that's better to keep it separated. Good point. There's a question from the audience. Um, is it? Uh, Possible to filter value directly with a dynamic field in the presentation? Somebody asks, and is it possible to have two y-axes? Okay, uh, from the presentation, actually no. Uh, dynamic field in presentation. Mm, actually, you have some dynamic filter, not filter, but you have these two checkbox in the main panel that uh, you hit the first one to just look at the just on the selected items in the map. You have the other one that is filtering dynamically, so live, just the items that, is, that are in the map in that moment. So if you are zooming in or zooming out, the plot is updating itself dynamically. And what was the second question? Uh, is it possible <laughs> to have two y-axes? Two y-axes. Uh, I don't know if Plot will support that, but uh, remember that for I'm, I'm remembering that for, for from ggplot, so for, from from R and R Studio, that having two y axes uh, it's not a good idea for Plot. I I I studied that some some years ago, and actually the I mean ggplot guys were against it. I I'm not sure that that Plotly supports it because I think they are going into the same direction because. They think that, I mean, they they claim that having two y-axis is kind of confusing the plot of what what you are what you are plotting in plot actually. Okay. Are there any more questions from the audience on also on the previous stuff, the exercise? 
If not, then uh, great thanks to Matteo, and uh, we can still ask questions to him. I hope he will stay for the Geo beers. Yeah, of course, I have a <laughs> cold beer in my fridge, of course, waiting for me. <laughs> Good, we're getting almost thirsty, so uh, let, let's go through the, the last few slides. Uh, I'll ask uh, Matteo to, to hide your screen and mute yourself, Yeah. and uh, I'll go through the last set of slides, and then uh, we're soon at the Geo beers. Yes, so uh, at the end of the, the session, we always have a little plug of what, what we can offer more for you in terms of courses. So um, I'll keep it again short because you, you know it from the previous sessions and, and hopefully you know what we offer. At IHE Delft, we have uh, OpenCourseWare, GISOpenCourseWare.org. You can look there for, uh, for many videos and tutorials on many different uh, topics related to, to GIS. Um, Hope you've noticed the YouTube channel. If you subscribe, you get automatic uh, updates. And uh, this video of this session will also be posted tomorrow there, so you can uh, watch it again. It will be also shared on social media. If you'd like to have a face-to-face -face course, you can join us in Delft uh, as soon as it's possible, of course. In September, there will be uh, normally a short course from 14 to 18 September. Uh, Kurt joined me in the last two years in, uh, in this course. And it's always great fun. We do a mapathon. And uh, we have people from all over the world uh, doing uh, GIS with us. And uh, there's online courses, and we are working currently on making the online course for uh, the book. So uh, that will uh, give you the official QGIS certificate and, of course, support from uh, Kurt and me in uh, getting through the course. So we keep you updated about progress on that. And we have many other plans, and we'll update you also on that. I'm going to give the word to, to uh, Kurt. Yeah, if, you, if people didn't see it, um, this is where we're all from. So I think it's pretty amazing um, how much of the world is represented in these webinars. So I just want to thank everybody for joining in. And, um, and I'll be the one kind of leading the way next week to show you some cartography tricks and how to make the nice plot that's on the, the cover of the book. And um, just to remind everyone, I, I did a, an episode of Mapscaping with Daniel Donahue um, a few weeks ago on QGIS and the QGIS project. And this coming Tuesday, I'm going to inter uh, he's going to interview me about um, Lutra Consulting's input and merge-in tools for field data collection and QField. So I'll be talking about those kind of QGIS-related um, mobile tools. And it will probably take a couple of weeks for it to come out, but but look for that. And just in general, I, I love I'm a, I love podcasts, and this mapscaping one is fantastic for um, all things geospatial. For example, he just had um, Paul Ramsey on talking about PostGIS recently. So um, if you're into podcasts, give this a, a listen. That's really great, and uh, I think it's a very nice topic uh, to cover the field data collection tools. I, I mentioned it a bit in my introduction. And there are two great tools for that. It's nice to, to look at the different uh, tools and to learn more about that. Uh, on the GIS Open Course, where there's a full tutorial uh, on input from Lutra Consulting. Lutra is the company also sponsoring these uh, sessions. And uh, I made that tutorial together with, uh, with Saber, from, uh, who is also frequently joining us. I don't know if he's around today. So uh, definitely I'll be, uh, I'll be looking forward to this uh, great podcast. The, the previous ones from Cord also have been, uh, been great. Then next week, the final session, unfortunately, because we're getting into some rhythm, we need to, to make some new chapters, I guess. All these new things coming, uh, coming out and uh, QGIS is not, uh, is not locked down. It's, it's continuously developing while we are uh, locked down, which is a good thing. So we'll probably never end with nice new features to, uh, to explain to you and to discuss. But next week, as, uh, as we promised, uh, the map design, and you will hear everything about uh, inverted polygon shape burst fills and uh, other tips and tricks to, to create really beautiful maps for your hydrological applications with uh, court of course. That brings me to um, the slide that I was longing for uh, <laughs> in the last minutes to, to have some uh, dual beers with you and if it's breakfast time have some coffee with us or lunch or your mate as we've seen last time so uh, I'll stop the recording